So in terms of biodiversity, um, most of us probably think that biodiversity is really important, and it is. Um, but there have been people, scientists, that have wondered, well, what if that's just all redundancy? What if there's, um, there's not actually the need to have lots and lots of plants or lots and lots of birds, and you just kind of need one plant and you need one bird, and ecosystems will function just as well with, um, without all that diversity. And so um, this, this kind of idea that, uh, that we don't need diversity was put forward as a neutral theory in ecology. And a lot of people have been pushing back for the last 20 years. Actually, I think we do need diversity and we're gonna design a whole lot of experiments to help, um, help prove that. So through doing all of this research on, on why, why some species are, are really important or why lots of species are really important, we, we came, we've come to this idea of, um, that, that some species play these really uh, exceedingly important roles in the ecosystem. And so sometimes we call these organisms keystone organisms. So keystone species was uh, coined by Robert Payne, who's shown there with a whole bunch of sea stars. Basically, sea stars were considered, um, well, Robert Payne and his students uh, figured out that sea stars, when they're present in tide pools, have this overwhelming kind of predator effect in tide pools. And so they did a lot of research where they, they picked them up and they chucked them out of tide pools, threw them into other places, um, and then watched what happened in the tide pool. And so um, other species that are considered keystone species are species like sea otters who prey on urchins. Urchins eat kelp. And so when you have sea otters present, you have these luxurious kelp beds and kelp forests. When you don't have sea otters present, the urchins eat up all the kelp and they disappear. Prairie dogs um, build these amazing burrow towns and those burrows help to aerate the soil and carry seeds and things throughout the landscape. So prairie dogs um, are keystone species in desert habitats. Sapsuckers can be keystone species by creating holes that organisms live in um, inside living trees. And so keystone species are species that are that disproportionately affect the rest of the community. And if they are, if they're removed, the whole community can collapse. And that's kind of why they're called a keystone because the figure on the, on the top there shows you an arch, it's called a keystone arch. It's built where all of the rocks are supported by the one keystone. And if you remove the keystone and the keystone arch, the whole arch will collapse. So here's a picture of uh, the sea star example. So sea stars, um, when the sea stars are present, um, in this case, the sea stars keep um, other organisms in check. And so the keystone predator um, allows for the presence of all of these other organisms like gooseneck barnacles and limpets and bivalves and chitons. And when you remove the, the predator, um, then often what happens is things like mussels take over and they push out all of the other organisms. And so the sea star basically, um, when it's not present, richness falls to very low levels. And this was, this was really worrisome because we had this sea star wasting disease in the past few years in our part of the world. And so a lot of us were really concerned that uh, intertidal zones were going to shift dramatically without the sea star. But I've, I've seen them coming back, so that's a good, that's a good sign. So some other um, terms. Some other species are unique or dominant, and we call them foundation species. These are species that they're not predators, right? So they're not um, kind of the same type of organism like we see with a keystone organism, but they're organisms that basically build the habitat for other organisms. So kelp, you could consider kelp to be a foundation species. So we use this term foundation species for species that structure the habitat for other species, cottonwood trees, produce these amazing riparian zones, so cottonwood trees might be right, foundation species. Eastern hemlock is a, a plant, a tree that's been um, damaged dramatically by woolly adelgids, um, and so the lack of eastern hemlock is a problem because that foundation species has disappeared from the landscape. And then the last Example are organisms called ecosystem engineers. They're species that alter and create habitat. So they're actually building habitat. So foundation species just are the habitat and ecosystem engineers build the habitat. So 
classic example of an ecosystem engineer is a beaver because beaver dams create these kind of wetland pond habitats that don't exist without them and then allow all of these other organisms to survive. Galling insects, same thing. The galler um, creates this habitat and then the habitat is usually serves a purpose for its own larvae, but then lots of other organisms make the gall home. And so that structure that the galling insect and the plant provided together um, basically is like an engineered structure. And so you can see two different kinds of galls, a different kind of aphid gall on a different kind of cottonwood. And then you have an, an adelgid gall um, on, on a conifer. So these are ecosystem engineers. And then the last um, kind of just super briefly, we're gonna talk a little bit about island biogeography. And so um, these are some, some folks that decided to do some really interesting studies on islands of different sizes. And what they found was that the number of species that they found on islands increased as the island got bigger and decreased as the island got farther away from the mainland because it took um, it was harder for species to colonize those islands. And so there's these really cool kind of curves you can build showing um, these colonization rates and extinction rates because of course on islands things can go extinct faster because population sizes are small. And so you can kind of map out and predict the number of species you might find on a given island based on its size and based on how far it is from the mainland. So that's called island biogeography, some of these theories. And then here's um, a more recent example. Um, I, a gentleman named Jose Maria Fernandez Palacios um, published a paper in Nature talking about how island biogeography patterns have been sh um, shifted or um, changed because of sea level change. So how climate change then might be influencing patterns of island biogeography, which I think is really fascinating. So kind of building on some of Daniel Simberloff and um, E.O. Wilson's experiments on near and far islands of different sizes, now adding this kind of climate change perspective. So really cool new research that uh, is built on some of these classic studies. And then finally, we're gonna end with this question of why are the tropics so species rich? The number of plant species per 10,000 square kilometers is really high at the equator and then it drops as you move toward the poles. And why is that? There's, um, it's kind of an unanswered question. Um, one, one theory is that high productivity promotes high biodiversity. Another is that high and steady temperatures promote stability um, and lots of organisms. And so we didn't have ice sheets in the tropics that caused extinctions of these organisms. And maybe that's partly why. Um, or the tropical regions are just really large. So kind of building on this idea of island biogeography that they're they're large areas and so they've had more time to develop. Um, and kind of to build on that steady temperature idea is that maybe there have been fewer uh, disturbances in tropical sites, fewer uh, volcanoes, fewer ice sheets, fewer um, you know, sea level rise events, things like that. There's lots of theories about why the tropics are so rich, but it's kind of an unanswered question still in ecology. So that's the last slide. Enjoy um, some of the add-on videos um, that provide some depth to this lecture. <laughs>